Hello and welcome to episode hashtag five of the Chit Chat Podcast. Um, just want to say a massive thank you to everyone for your support. I really do appreciate it. Um, please subscribe to us on YouTube or Apple Podcasts or any of the platforms. We are, we are trying to get to 100 subscribers across all our platforms, so please help that, uh, make that happen. Um, I hope everyone is doing good and staying safe and most importantly, wearing a mask. Now, you might not think it would affect you, but it could affect others. So please, when you can, wear a mask. It's not that difficult. Like, don't get me wrong, everyone at some point has the right to be a small bit selfish and to put themselves first. But now is the time to think of others and help save lives. So just wear a mask. That's my little rant over before we get going. But um, now on today's podcast, as you've seen from the title, I'm joined by a good friend of mine who you may know from the hit Irish TV show Love, Hate, and also Dancing with the Stars, and so much more. It's the incredible Johnny Ward, everyone. Johnny, mate, how are you? And thanks for coming on the podcast. Hiya, Evan. What's the story? Sorry about that. It wasn't... <laughs> I thought I was going to get a bit of a break from the wardens. Left, right. <laughs> wear a mask. Come on, wear a mask. What a podcast. <laughs> Oh man, I'm good. And as I was just saying to you a second ago, it's so, it's so good to see you. It's Likewise. So, so good to see you. And I'm loving this. I've been looking at one or two of your podcasts with obviously Richie and stuff like that. And fair yeah. play. It's such a great setup. It really, really is. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And it was just something that I wanted to get going and I've always wanted to do. And I said, you know what? In lockdown, that's the perfect time to get started. But I would say to you, Johnny, how's your lockdown been and how, what have you been getting up to? But if you follow Johnny on Instagram, you've been working out like an animal, doing insanity every day and stuff. And yeah. I know you're big into your fitness and we'll talk more in detail about that. But I think we can safely say you've taken full advantage of the gyms being closed. How are all the workouts going for you? I suppose after the whole, when lockdown began and no one knew what was going on and, you know, us as actors or performers as well, we're very, very conscious of conversation. What's next in the pipeline? And we all fall victim to, oh, you always want to say something's happening. Yeah. And then we can't say, oh, well, there's, there's nothing. My plan B is always teaching. So I yes. teach kids, you know, drama yeah. uh, and singing as well. And then when that's not happening, like during the summer, I've been really lucky. I've been blessed the last three summers because Copperface Jackson years ago, yes. going on the doll. Do you know what I mean? Which is, yeah. which is then... The next plan is the gym. And when that's all taken away from you, like, I've got to go. So um, I suppose I invested all my time in pretty much just sticking to different workouts. I started doing a thing. Um, it was just like this six-day challenge thing. And then that turned into a 63-day a challenge thing, which is this. <laughs> now, I'll be honest with you. Um, yeah. I felt like I was annoying people with the whole day three of insanity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, sweat pouring down your two. face. Yeah, and one or two people said to me, Would you ever put a grip on the insanity thing? You know, I'm sitting at home, I'm on eating burger, I'm watching Netflix. The last yeah. thing I want to see is some annoying chap going, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's free and I'm almost dead and stuff. So, and I'm not going to lie, I have been lazy with it recently. I was back on it today, but yeah. it was a friend of mine's birthday. Uh, this weekend, a few of us met up. We stuck to the whole, you know, social distance and stuff like that. Wore the masks, just so you know, Evan. Yeah. And uh, we took a, I took a bit of a break from it. So yeah. I'm about three days behind, but I'll, I will do it because I've got OCD like that. And uh, and that's pretty much how I've been spending. Lot. The beginning was all about songs, right? Yes. Up, then it was poetry, and then I ran out of ideas. And like, I might as well do the fitness thing. And I was gonna do the podcast thing, but yeah. a lad I worked with called Evan completely stole my idea. So here I am. Think about it. Big Big <laughs> Look, I had the microphone set up at all. I was supposed to interview Evan and he got there before. <laughs> Your microphone looks a lot more professional than mine. This looks like it was something from a pound shop. Well, I will say a pound shop. Yes, yes. Um, but look, what keeps you motivated or gets you out of the bed every day to go and do a workout? Um, no, 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 no not a lot. <laughs> I'm honest with you. Um, it's been very difficult. I, I started a routine which was like getting up at 10 a.m. So not too early, not too late. Yeah. And uh, today I stayed in until about half past one. Oh. Just, uh, I will do it. You need those days though. Guilty um, is, 
I was just sitting around, I was like, okay, all these, you know, you can do all these, you know, interval training and body workouts. And then I looked into, I'm living with my sister and she's got a room literally just in there. Yeah. I said, can we turn this music room, because obviously she's a, a singing teacher, we turn it into a gym. She was like, yeah, I'm up for that. I said, do you want to do this thing with me? So just spends a lot of money on weights and stuff. But now I'm kind of, oh, it was exciting for a while. And I think we yeah. all went massive, like shopping things. And, you know, the DPD van would arrive and we go, oh, what is it for me? <laughs> I think I've overdone that so much that when there's a, a package for me now, I just go, oh, I don't want that. Just yeah, yeah, get it out. Yeah. So um, just, wait, and you know, our fingers crossed. And I know an awful lot of the, say, performing arts schools, they're back. Um, a few of my friends doing performing arts school like in summer camps and stuff like that this Monday and I yeah. really miss that I really do miss that routine and I suppose what I'm trying to do throughout the whole lockdown thing is substitute your usual routine with something else which is fitness and just getting in shape yeah. and, and then I gave up I gave up drinking for exactly bang on two and a half months wow. and then I met up with friends last week and I got peer pressured into having like uh, two or three drinks three drinks became four and then, sure, I stayed the whole weekend, and I can't remember. No, I Pastor, look, that wouldn't be like you. That wouldn't be like you at all. And not, at, not at all. <laughs> remember what a pioneer I was during yeah. pandemic. Really. <laughs> like, I, I think being healthy is so important. Like, you don't have to go to the gym every day and have massive muscles or whatever. But um, it, no, well, that's where you're wrong, Evan. Now, sorry <laughs> to cut across. <laughs> it can. <laughs> it can, it, it can I be. I beg to now, Evan. Actually, to be honest with you, go on, I'm joking, man. I'm joking. It can be um, simple things like just drinking more water or eating healthier. But for me, when I eat good and work out, my mind is in such a better place. And I know for me, during lockdown, my sleep hasn't been the best, and I've been having weird dreams and all that. And I've kind of noticed for me personally, when I do eat well and do one workout it doesn't even it's only, I think I only do like half an hour but when I do a workout my mind is in a much better place and I get a better night's sleep do you believe that the the key to achieving like fitness goals and stuff is um eating right and is it good for a healthy mind yeah absolutely but I would say a healthy balance as well like I went all out and I met I met up with a few friends who I hadn't seen this was when obviously the restrictions eased and I could see a few more people and they were all, you know, having a few drinks, nothing mental. But I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. No, no. And I kind of look back on that and go, I should have used that time wisely. It was once in a blue moon, I'm going to see them and stuff like that. Yeah. But, oh, man, took the, honestly, took the words out of my, took the words out of my mouth. There's a really, really, really good point. And it's like, you know, you wake up, I suppose when you're not in your usual routine, just it gives you this massive sense of worthiness, achievements. Yeah. And, that's combined with, you know, I started getting into meditations and meditations were uh, recommended to me by my, my best mates. And he just said, you know, he's got, he's got a, he's got a wife and he's got two kids and not that they were struggling or anything, but I, I you know, I was having, oh, God, this is tough. I can only imagine what that's like with a wife and kids. It must be really, really tough. Yeah. Tell me about these 21 day meditation channel challenges. I was like, ah, look, I'm all for the challenges. <laughs> and I really found that that was really beneficial towards a good night's sleep but unfortunately recently i don't know it's been it's been tough and i'm in a really weird time lapse now i'm still doing everything but it's very difficult to to wake up if i want oh, 10 o'clock in the morning when you don't have actually anything to wake up for yeah first thing in your mind going oh look i had i had that this morning actually i was in bed probably about half 10 still and my mom came in she's like um are you getting up and i went to her well what do I have to get up for? Do you know what I mean? I was kind of yeah. biding my time as to what I wanted to do. But we move on. Johnny, you aren't just an actor. You're also a singer and a dancer. And I know this from working with you in the panto. Before we get into the TV end of things, um, you're no stranger to the world of panto here in Ireland. And we've had some amazing crack on stage together at Christmas. What's your <laughs> favorite part of panto? Now, we do know you're fond of a bit of ad lib on stage, shall we say. Um, I spot particularly with the Limerick Panther as well. Just it's um, I don't know. There's something great about being asked. I don't know the, the ones that I always did before with the gaiety, and I, I did love yeah. the gaiety. There's a lot of traveling involved and stuff like that, getting in and stuff, and it's a very long schedule. But I enjoyed it, and I made friends for life in there, big time. Um, I don't know. There was something about waking up in Limerick and just being there on the premises and 
I mean, they're putting in these incredible, as you know yeah. yourself, incredible digs. Yeah. It's just very special about it this year. We had an awful lot of fun. But not only that, um, we had an awful lot on, on stage. <laughs> I was not let away with murder or that Ponto. I'm not so, going to lie. It was the, the worst you know, going on stage with you sometimes because you go on stage and you go, what is he going to do now? What is he going to do now? What is he going to do now? There was one time and there was just a bit of a change in the routine and it was when, um, it was when Richie had, had come back. Yeah. Uh, and it was like, oh, nice, you know, Richie's back. And my, we're kind of getting used to Evan there for a while. Was, Evan's back here. Okay, right up. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to go away. Right, okay, have I got all my stuff ready? Brilliant, because it's just a slight change of routine. I was like, brilliant, here we go. And I opened up the whole show as Abadaz or the Jafar sort of character. Right. You know what? I am going to rock this show. Curtain goes up. <clears throat> I remember this. And there's a little kid in the front row going, we can't hear you! We can't hear you! <laughs> I completely forgot to put the microphone on. And everyone's there. I was like, you know, it's not as if it's just one thing. So obvious, I completely forgot. Yeah. And then the stage tech is there. Put the mic on. <laughs> they can hear me screaming my head off. They come off, no voice. And then I think it was the same. Oh, you know, God, I remember that. Afterwards, forgetting the lump. And, oh, yeah. You know, just, just adding in a few things and also having the crack. But I think the most important part is, yeah, you're, you're adding in a few things, but looking out to the audience. And it, it kind of goes over there. It kind of go over their head, you know? Yeah. But, uh, I don't know. I suppose I get a deja vu effect of Panto when you look out at the kids and you see yourself as that kid, you know? Yeah. A few years back and, you know, and traditionally, and traditionally it was, it was always the gayest Panto that I went to as a kid, obviously being in Dublin. And I was like, I was that kid. And also, it's very rare in this, especially now <laughs> with what we're living in, that friends... Fa particularly family can all come together and enjoy a show yeah. you go to like a family film or whatever in the cinema the majority of the time you will see right parents will bring them down to Peppa Pig and I'll, I'll go on me <laughs> or whatever and yeah. update status or whatever then with or you know with kid oh, I don't want to be watching that but Panto is something for everyone because it has that old traditional old school fairy tale of let's just say Jack and the Beanstalk or Aladdin or Beauty yeah. and the Beast and then there's loads and loads of jokes that just completely fly over their kids' heads that could be, you know, very much over 18 and stuff like that. And there is something for everyone. And when you look out, it's rare because especially in theatre, I'm not talking about Panto, but like with a, a straight stage play, if you are not on top of your game, that audience will let you know. And there's always a yeah. very, uh, you know, you can come off and you could feel really, really paranoid. But with, with Panto at the end of it, everyone's smiling and it's all traditional and stuff like that. And everyone seems to be having a, a good time. Yeah. You, know? um, you mentioned like being a kid in the audience and watching. Let's go back to young Johnny Ward as a kid. I'm intrigued yeah. to know when I have people on the podcast, how they got into the entertainment industry because everyone's stories are different. How did you get involved in it all? Mom, honest man, I just woke up in a drama class, really. Like it was um, <laughs> about two weeks ago. <laughs> So I woke up in the drama class. Um, my my sister Maureen, who's like Maureen, be eleven years old. I mean, then the Susan, she's two and a half years older. We went to a local uh, speech and drama teacher called Mary Birchill. Yeah. And it started off from there, and like I said, I was, I think two and a half to three, doing my first mime. And apparently, in my very first mime, like in the preliminary exam or whatever, I just spoke to the whole. Like it was supposed to be the magic stick. <laughs> There was me with this magic stick, <clears throat> and I was saying to him, I'm going to pick up the stick now. <laughs> mobile phone into a hat. And, the, and then it just kind of went on from there. And then I was like doing poetry. We'd always be put into like the Fesh Kiel and Fesh Matthew in Dublin. And then uh, Sligo Fesh Kiel, Sliggy Fesh Kiel, Arklo, Navan, oh, you name it. Anytime there was like yeah. a, a singing or drama competition, and it would be something like, you know, an extract from Peter Pan by J.M. Barry. Captain Hook speaking, and Arr, that kind of stuff. that's how it started. And then yeah. first film was when I was eight and it was a little, just a, a one line part in a film called The Boy From Mercury. Um, yeah. And then it just went on from that. And then after that, I went on to a different uh, drama teacher. Um, and that kind of became like a, a stage school. Then it was an agency. And then, 
there was always that thing as oh, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to do singing. I'd rather do the drama. And then you got slagged for it an awful lot in school. Yeah, one hundred percent. You know, it wasn't. Uh, it was very frowned upon back then. You know, oh, your man, he, he does singing and stuff like that. Yeah. I was just, you know, <clears throat> taunted a lot in school. You're gay. You're gay. You're gay. You're gay. But I did stick to it, and it was something I remember my dad saying to me. He was just like. Why don't you take advantage of the whole situation? I was like, what are you talking about? He says, well, how many of you are in the class? I was like, 23 of us. And how many of you are boys? And I was like, me and this other lad. He was like, why don't you take advantage of the situation? So yeah. I did that. And I stuck to it. And But that's, yeah. how, that's how I got involved in it. Um, now, we'll talk about Fair City, right? Ireland's top soap. Um, I am, am I right in saying you actually played six different characters on the show? Six, yeah. I think it's six. It started off when I was 15 being called in to do, uh, again, a one-liner with Bella Doyle asking for whiskey behind yeah. the bar. And then going from there, there was another... Oh, a band I was in called Lost in Cell with my sister. They had heard us playing in Vicar Street. Someone, had, One of the people in um, Fair City and they said, would you come in and play that song? It's an original song, is it? Yeah. Like, yeah. So we did that. <clears throat> and then the third one was a part called Greener. Greener was a bully. He bullied a um, character played by Shane McDade. It was all about this cult sort of uh, thing that was going on. And then they brought him back. And then it was Kurt. And Kurt Whelan was, uh, I was looking at the contract and was like, this is like a, just under a year contract. Yeah. About this. And I kept my mouth shut and say, <laughs> right under the age, don't say a word. Don't say a word. I was like, I know, but Brainer was only in it about two, three months ago. I, have you been in this before? About what? Have you been in it before? <laughs> and my cat died earlier on. Can you speak up? Oh, it doesn't matter. Come on, carry on. Uh, oh, yeah. Got a football, just run it up and down. I was in the middle of RTA, Evan, right? Yeah. Just in the middle of RTA, they wanted to see if I could play football. Oh, can I walk? <laughs> I'm dribbling around these things, making a show myself. But I got the part, and I was over the moon, and I had so much fun, and I was about... I think I had the time about 17. But that was a, like that went on for just under a year, that part. And yeah. then I had just come back from when Love Hate had happened and another thing, Clan of the Cave Bear. Clan yeah. of the Cave Bear, cut a long story short, was like this Fox TV production. They put $32 million into it. We're still supposed to be there now. Uh, this <laughs> is 2015. Myself and Aidan McArdle and Charlie McKenna <clears throat> were all involved. And like Ron Howard, he produced us. Linda Wolverton wrote it. She's the director, or she's the writer of The Lion King, like wrote the whole thing. Wow. And we're meeting all these people. Pierre Morel, he's the director. He directed Taken. I was like, this is a dream come true. Yeah. We, well, we spent a full summer, about, about two and a half months, three months in South Africa. And then we came back in November and heard, it's not happening. So then, yeah, now that's a really, that can be a really, yeah. really depressing thing because you're, you think you're going to be in the limelight and you think you're going to, you know, you've just worked with all these people and on paper, these people are, you know, hey, this. Yeah, people. yeah. And then you're back to square one and then an audition just came in and my agent Maureen just said, well, look, there's a park going in Fair City. <laughs> I, was like, I, can't go. I can't go into Fair City again. I, I can't fathom how one person can play so many characters. It was five. I've so just realised it wasn't six, it was five. Right. Like, oh, I can't go into Fair City again. I laugh. <laughs> and I went in and no one, no one said, no one bat an eyelid. <laughs> but it was, like, that was a long time. Like, that was, oh, that's the good space of, what, uh, 14 years since I've been in it before. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. A lot of parts, very short term when I was a kid or a teenager. But no, that was a long term. And I, like, they, they knew. And they had said it before. And uh, But I went in with the, kind of, the, like, the longest beard I had just to kind of, so they wouldn't recognize me. And, <laughs> I had a had an absolute. Had you, an play, absolute. you played. You um, played. Was it Kieran Holloway who kidnapped Katie yeah. in the story? How was playing yeah. a storyline like that? It was great. It was uh, Bridgie had taken me in. <clears throat> Bridgie, the chorus, he, he was pretty much in charge of the whole place, and she was like, "Listen, I was looking at it. I was like, this is this is a two year contract, and I haven't a clue what I am doing, who yeah. I am, have I any family members?" And she goes, "We're going to have a meeting." And then coincidentally, she said it to. Like one of my childhood best friends, uh, Amelia Stewart, she was like, you're going to be kidnapped. And I was like, what? So she pretty much said, yeah, there's a backstory. Emmett, her brother, used to go out with your sister. 
you don't, he, no one knows that you know about it, but then she went off and she got killed and you haven't seen her again. And you blame him because you, she, you think that she committed suicide over Emmett breaking her heart. Right, that was the thing. I was like, right, that's fine. I'm going to kidnap Amelia to kind of level with him. And she's like, yeah, brilliant. Okay, yeah. And that all happened. And then, put a long story short, well, after like, Two years uh, of like the uh, the longest the yeah. long story like story of, of all time, and I got a lot of abuse from that. Women hit me with handbags and kids spitting on me. <laughs> off the street of the storyline. But the, here's the funny thing: is then after that, the whole um, it was about like two years where it wasn't in it. I got a phone call. I was like, "Oh yeah, he's coming back." I was like, "Am I not dead?" Because the last time, you know, Katie stabbed me and I fell off a cliff. And she goes, no, so what we're going to do is, um, Tessa, your sister, yeah, well, she was actually alive the whole time. <laughs> so I kidnapped this girl. <laughs> Other ways of time, there was nothing wrong with my sister at all. Yeah. <laughs> Tessa go, why didn't you just answer the phone? <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. Oh, God. Um, that's, uh, when you talk about characters and stuff, I want to talk about something which I love personally about acting and playing a character. It's like the character research and delving into characters and background stories, etc. Do you have a particular method when prepping for a character on a show? Um, if we go back to something like Love Hate, that's the one I probably took it to like its most yeah. intense level. And the reason being is because I'd see, I've been seen for the first season and it clashed with something else. And I actually went for the other gig, which was Dollhouse, because if I'm honest with you, I much prefer the script of Dollhouse compared to Love Hate. And also the part that I had, like it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. worth talking about at all. Um, and then I was seen for season two. And at this rate, people started talking about, you know, love, hate. Mm -hmm. After season three, it was sort of like, it kind of replaced the, the Monday morning talk of football. It was actually, oh, that love, hate thing's actually, it's, it's Irish. Oh. It's actually good and it's worth watching and stuff. And I think it was a, like I mentioned before, I think it was the first time RTE really took uh, yeah. A risk because you had other productions like Father Ted and um, Mrs. Brown's Boys taken over by BBC and Channel 4 and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's the going for that part again and being refused for it. I think when it actually happened in season five, and I remember being over in London at the time, and Maureen rang and said, Do you want to see you again? And I went, Right. And I actually came back a day earlier. I said, When is the audition? She was like, It's in four days' time. Right. I got the script and it was just three, three sides, yeah. three uh, yeah, different scenes. And I learned it so much so that I knew it backwards of him. Yeah. And I was like, right, this guy, he rides a motorbike. He's Hispanic. I just started, and I don't know, it didn't even, I didn't Google things or anything like that. I just thought, what would I do on that? And wrote down so many stage directions just to myself. Yeah. Think, what if, you know, because you go into an audition and you practice and practice and you read off at one person, one person, and yeah. whether it be your, your mom or your father, your, your girlfriend, boyfriend, reading it over and over again with that one person. And then you go into another audition room and they'll give you the line differently. And you can, you can sort of panic and go, oh, I'm not used to that. Yeah. Because I suppose it's like, you know, being in a show and then there's a new member of cast. Oh, you know, this is different. And I honestly just went over and I says, can you do it this way? And when you're reading it, can you do it aggressive? Can you do it this way? And my mom and dad were just like, what is going on? That's the most prepared. I read. And it's not a healthy way of doing it, but it's pretty much preparing yourself for sort of any scenario moment. Yeah. 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 Love, hate, which, which was sen sensational and still is to this day. I think personally, it's possibly one of the best TV shows to have aired on Irish television. Yeah. It's based, if anyone that doesn't know that's listening, it's based um, on a, a drug gang in Dublin, Ireland. And I think it has been so successful because it was so realistic and not far-fetched, which people and myself really enjoyed about the show. And myself and my dad are actually watching it back now on RTE every Monday. Yeah, it's on yeah. at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, so we're watching it back then from the start. Um, obviously, you played Paulie, like we spoke about, in season five. Knowing the success that the show was gaining, were you nervous about joining the cast? You know, earlier on when we were chatting about the anxiety of sleeping and stuff like that, because we have yeah. and stuff, I didn't sleep. Honestly, for the first, I'd say, three weeks, I didn't sleep at all. Because yeah. if it had been uh, 
if I had have been season one, you know, you get to know each other, you, everyone gets to know each other. You're all starting from the step, from level one. Yeah. But then you go on and you, you, you go in, it was like, and I remember Maureen just ringing me and she's going, oh my God, you, you have it, you have it. Oh my God, oh my God. Oh, it's, yeah. it's t- <laughs> tomorrow. The script's okay. Filing in the script. So I was like, oh gee, I don't know. Like having a full blown panic attack because yeah. you go in and you meet uh, Tom Von Lawler. Yeah. Edge, who's pretty much, and especially at the time, everyone was just completely, they still are, but yeah. everyone was completely obsessed with them. Uh, Lawrence Kinlan, Peter Coonan, Charlie Murphy, Ava McGinty, and you, you're looking at, and these are the, these guys are the reason that Love Hate is such a success. Then you're looking at Stuart Carolyn, who's the writer, and something to touch upon what you said, it is so close to home. It's so close to home because Stuart used to be an ex-journalist. So yeah. everything he's writing is pretty much, a lot of it is based on true events. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and David Caffrey, you know, worldwide famous director. So you, you kind of look at all these people going, this is really daunting. This is really daunting. And I'm going to be crap. Oh, my God. <laughs> what the hell I was thinking? Nah, it's not for me. It's not for me. And then he went home and stuff. And I suppose I just, I, I suppose one thing I did, I remember the first, the very first scene. <laughs> and we're in, it's in the towers in Ballymun. Yeah. And it's me and... Uh, it's me and Nidge, and this is the, like the scene where you just because I was pretty much sent over. Uh, Paulie was sent over by Karen's big balls, my uncle's gangster name, to yeah. keep it in Nidge to make sure Nidge is on his toes. So it was a very powerful part to play, and that was everyone else where they're sort of kind of you know licking up to Nidge or he's this that and the other. I had a very 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 you know I had to be quite dominating, but in a very sincere and. Uh, a non-effortless way, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I remember the very first scene, and I, I'd know, I didn't even have a line on it. And Nidge turns to Trish, and he's like, oh yeah, this is Polly. Uh, turns big balls now, or something like that. And then Charlie Murphy comes in. And then it said in the script, Polly smiles, right? <laughs> Polly smiles. <laughs> what, I think what they wanted was just a bit of a, or, a, or just a polite sort of, yeah. And I went, <laughs> cut, cut, <laughs> right over to me. Just a bit more, a bit more. Forget, forget the smile, actually. He's blocked. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they just did it again. And every time I look back on that scene, which is every single night, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, oh, it's so cringe. Like, it's so cringe. But, uh, <laughs> No, I'm just going to say, uh, you look very well from after falling off a balcony. Like, you look like you're in great shape oh, and stuff, you know? I haven't turned around yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, you know what? I still have that on, on video. The, the makeup, just the, oh, the budget that went into it. Yeah. And you're going on, you know, you're sitting there in makeup for about seven and a half hours and they've just done your whole face. Like, it was like two face from Batman. <laughs> and then funny that, I remember... Something about love hate as well. There was one scene where I get off a balcony and I have to rob your man's bike, I rob a guy's bike. I said, Get off the bike because we're about to yeah. kill the traveler. Um, what's um, I can't remember his name. He just came out. John Connors plays him. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, get off the bike, and then they're just like, you have to, You're gonna kill the you're gonna kill the macker, and you have to do this. <laughs> and we did all that, and Preparing and preparing and preparing. I'm going to jump off this guy's bike and then I'm going to rob his bike and then we're going to go off. Now, luckily I drove, I ride motorbikes. I think it's the only reason I got in the park. <laughs> <laughs> I jumped it off. Brilliant. I, at the time, rode like a Suzuki Intruder 800cc. Mm. That's, like, that's a cruiser. This thing is a Suzuki Hayabusa 1300cc, which then was the fastest bike you can get. And I had practiced it and practiced it with the stuntman. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, jump off his bike. Me as a pillion passenger on the Ducati, jump off. You, get off the fucking bike. He goes, boom, and I'm off. And we did it and did it and did it again. And then I don't know what happened, but then, and this is about three weeks in. Yeah. David, the, you know, the director and stuff like that, some of the, you know, kids in the local area, are like, that's the little hey! Little hey, there's loads of them around. Look at it. And... Like there's kids on the horses with the, the days off. And I remember, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But we're there, three, two, one, action. Boom, get off the bike, get off the fucking bike. 
helmet on, vroom, and the whole thing just starts doing the weeding. There's like a roundabout, I remember about, looking, I was like 100 meters away. I must have got, it felt like I got there in about two seconds. Yeah. I almost killed myself, went off the ramp, and no one saw it apart from Paul, the guy in charge of tr transport. And they're all going, yeah, that was deadly, that was brilliant. I was like, yeah, I know, I meant every bit of it. <laughs> Just limping into the thing going, oh, I almost killed myself, but not like crazy. Yeah. The budget like this. But even remember, and this just goes to show, you know, and this was my first day as well. We cut for break. And like I say, the kids in, you know, Ballybum, they were, they were all getting the day off school, but there's right, no way I'm going to school. Yeah, yeah. It's just going to be in my area. Because word got out that they were filming in Ballymun. And I'll never forget, we're in a six-seater taxi. Frank, the taxi driver, is bringing us back to base. It was me, Peter Kinnan, who plays Fran, Lawrence Kinnan, who plays Elmo, and Tom Von Lawler, who plays Nidge. And kids jumped up on top of the six-seater taxi just to get that close yeah. to, to Nidge. Do you know what I mean? And there's me like a passenger, literally a passenger in the back of <laughs> Oh my God, this is mental. But yeah, Who unreal. Me? Who me? Yeah, I was, wow, it was unreal. unreal. Um, I mentioned earlier how you are not just an actor. You can do it all. Um, you appeared on the third series of Dancing with the Stars here in Ireland, which is the Irish yeah. version of Strictly Come Dancing. Um, you came runner-up, which is phenomenal. What was Dancing with the Stars experience like for you? And did you think you would go so far? Um, no. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no, yes, not a, on a, and do you know? Do you know why? And this is what I've realised about everything. I, the first time I, I got the call for it, Larry Bass and you know Shina Will they had come to see Poppers, yeah. and they gone about you know love hate and fair city and stuff, but Coppers there was a bit of movement in it, uh, like my God, nothing like Dance with the Stars, but you know very sort of ensemble kind of moves like yeah. And I got the call from that. I was like, would you be interested in doing it? I, straight away, it was a no-brainer. I said to, said to Maura, that's something I'd, I'd absolutely bloody love to do. Yeah. And, and when I met everyone for the first time, we do this, they do this meet and greet and they take you away to do kind of like some secret pub where you meet all the professionals and then also the other people who are going to be on it. And I remember meeting Peter Stringer for the first time. Now, Peter Stringer is a, a, just a boyhood hero of mine. Like, yeah. Oh. I remember having a VHS there and watching Ireland beating France over and over again every single night of the week himself, Roman Gower, Brian O'Driscoll. And Peter Stringer was a scrum half and I was a scrum half and I just I just loved the guy. He was the first person I saw. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. In the likes of, you know, Darren Kennedy, Holly Carpenter. Um, and I suppose, you know, you go on, people are saying, you need to go on Instagram. So I'm not going on Instagram. I don't do social media. I don't want to do anything. Yeah. And then I'd see them like... <laughs> 1.4 million like <laughs> stuff. there's me new off the scene like uh no i didn't think i'd have a chance but i did realize it is very much about uh who you are in there and you're best off coming across like yourself yeah it it, it shines through and there, there's two or three of them in there who you know gave off a bit of a fake thing about themselves at the start and it was it, it did shine through and you know what the whole the whole experience for me i i loved it very daunting, very nerve-wracking. It's very nerve-wracking, Evan, to go out into a similar industry that you're, a similar venue that you're used to, and you think, yeah. if I talk or sing, you know, people will be entertained, but then you're doing something that you're sort of familiar with, but not using it as your forte. Really, was, it, really was it tough learning all the different styles of ballroom? <laughs> yeah, there wasn't one week. There wasn't one week that was, uh, switch up week was easy because I had, uh, I had, I don't know, it was a, yeah, it was a breath of fresh air. Yeah. That makes sense. And it was a new voice. So that was kind of easier to do. But uh, no, all the rest of it, yeah, it was, it was very, very, very difficult. Very tough. Um, now, Copper's The Musical, which you mentioned briefly earlier, that has become a huge success after it's won in the Olympia Theatre in Dublin. For anyone that doesn't know, tell us what the show is about and who your character is. Okay, so Copper Face Jack's The Musical is about a guy called Gino Wiles. And Gina Wiles is the captain of the Dublin football team. Now, yeah. that's the Dublin GA football team, which is classed over here as an amateur sport. So when he's not doing that, he needs to pay the bills. And he is a clamper. And he spends his days going around clamping 
everyone that is not from Dublin. <laughs> yeah, there's a massive rivalry over here between Dublin and Kerry in the GAA. Yeah. And ironically, a week before the All-Ireland final between Dublin and GAA, he falls in love with a girl called Nolene de Geralt, who's from Cacher Sivine in County Kerry. And she is has just moved into Dublin pursuing... <laughs> Pursuing her dream of working in the claims department of the VHI oh. <laughs> in a bed set over Copper Face Jacks. She yeah. hears the music, she's there telling her to turn the music down. She comes down, she meets Gino, play with myself, and then the rest, then that's when it becomes like uh, Romeo and Juliet kind of slash, you know. West Side Story, but it's all to do with you. Have you seen it, Evan? No, I've not been... seen. I've not seen it yet. No, because I was living uh, over in London. Do you know what? Of all the things, um, and we were talking about all the others, like with the dance with the stars and Fair City Love Hate. I've never had more fun in anything. It doesn't. It doesn't seem like work. There's a lot of work involved, but I can't. I can't. It's just a phenomenal everything that you get in. There's no. There's never any drama. There's never. Any, there's, it's just a lovely bunch of people. Yeah. To, See that every night, and to know to walk into the Olympia Theatre each night and go, I'm going to walk off tonight with a standing ovation because of Maniac 2000, because of a phenomenal script with Paul Howard. Yeah. Debbie, Debbie Kieran does the choreographer. Yeah. Uh, choreography. All of that. It's just, it's brilliant. It's flawless. And I know I'm really selling it like, oh, the best. <laughs> there is a reason it's coming back every single summer. And you know yeah. what? This summer was a big letdown. We, sh- we should be doing it now. We should be down in. I think it's Cork, which should be now, obviously in the UCH down in Limerick and yeah. Limerick as well. But they sort of, um, it, th- that was a real downtime because it was supposed to be 25th of May. I was like, look, lockdown, it's only going to happen for about three weeks yeah. more, into the routine. But they did a drive-in movie there. Um, yes, I saw that actually, yeah. I was, un- and I was thinking, this, oh, this is this stage show being yeah. shown. And we went in and we were all very nervous and they gave the frequency to each car and stuff. And it was a massive, a massive success. And I suppose it was difficult and different to, when you're on the stage and you're given that line, you can hear that laughter, and, you know, it's bouncing back. Yeah. It's a really lovely, I don't know, a weird sense of, not achievement, but uh, guys, well done. That, that was great. Just looking at someone in their car that you can't hear eating popcorn and kind of laughing themselves stupid. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Thing. And I love um, it. Good to see everyone as well. Lastly, before we go, um, Johnny, who is your favourite actor to watch on screen or who are you inspired by? Just because maybe there'll be some performers listening and they can go and get some inspiration. Who inspires you and who's one of your favourite actors to um, watch? I, I'd, I'd have to say... Uh, with different genres and stuff like that, there's different people, and I'm like, oh god, I love him, or I love him, or I love her. Yeah, I love, I love Denzel Washington. I've always loved him. I've never, I've never seen a, I've n- I haven't seen a bad film in a minute. I yeah. just, I don't know, and he inspires me as well. Obviously, at a young age, I was inspired by, you know, this. I, I think a lot of what people have with the likes of, you know, Muhammad Ali and Bruce Lee, all that kind of stuff. But no, acting wise, definitely. Definitely Denzel Washington. Definitely. But yeah. Johnny, look, it's so good to see you. Um, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Listen, thank you so much for having me. And it's great. It's honestly great to see you as well. It's been Likewise. Ages. I know, um, it's been, been too long. And fingers crossed. Fingers crossed now we'll be doing pod to all over again. Hopefully, hopefully. We'll have to think about it. <laughs> remember guys to please subscribe if you haven't already on any of our platforms we're trying to get 100 subscribers on each streaming platform and thank you all again for your support and messages they do really mean the world to me and um, follow us on instagram at the chit chat podcast on twitter at the chit chat underscore and facebook at the chit chat podcast guys i'm evan o'hanlon from the chit chat podcast thank you so much for listening